So, um, welcome to the Well and Plains Land Care webinar, webinar series. Today, uh, we are focusing on animal production and what we need to look out for this spring. Our guest speaker is Sally Balmain from Local Land Services. Just keep going. Just um, some housekeeping. Please mute your microphone when not in discussions um, and use the comments box to ask a question during the presentation. Uh, time will be set aside to answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, I'll be keeping track of um, the questions. So if I miss anything, when we are at the end of the webinar, please unmute your microphone, jump in and um, yeah, and let me know. So just in case I miss anything, um, hopefully we can answer some of your questions that you may have arising. Um, uh, firstly, we'll do our welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge that this webinar is being held on the traditional lands of the Gomoroi people. And I extend that to include the traditional lands where you are joining us from today. I pay my respect to elders, both past, present and future. This project is supported by Northwest Local Land Services through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. This has been made possible today uh, with Northern Slopes Land Care and Wilburn Plains Land Care. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Sally Balmain uh, from Northwest Local Land Services. She'll be uh, presenting our webinar today. Just bear with me. And pause, share, stop sharing. Okay, Thanks, Sally, Ken. you should be able to go now. Okie dokie. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope... Um, you can see that okay. Pen, just give me the thumbs up if that's coming up all right. Let's get it to run the slideshow. Um, so thank you all for taking time out of your day. Um, hopefully um, it's wet where you are and you were inside anyway, but hopefully the rain didn't fall in a way that damaged anyone's crops and, and things like that. Um, so today I just wanted to touch on um, some issues maybe um, that might be coming up as we move into spring and summer, um, supplementing spring and summer crops and pastures and um, heat stress and, and weather events. Um, that's the broad agenda I've done up. If anyone has anything that they'd like to talk about, contrary to that, please please just let us know, I'm pretty flexible today. I did have a few questions. So maybe if you wanted to either unmute yourself and let me know or type a message um, in the comments um, box and Penn will have a look at them for me, just so I know mostly where to target um, my talk. Um, all ruminants, but there are some subtle differences between cattle, sheep and goats. So if you're mainly cattle, mainly sheep or mainly goats, um, please feel free to let us know that. Um, and then also, yeah, if there's anything specific you want touched on today, um, bang a comment through to Penn um, and she can let us know um, sort of roughly what the breakdown is. Um, and that'll just help me tailor my presentation. It's a bit awkward talking into a computer screen um, compared to a live audience. But anyway, I'm sure we'll muddle, muddle through. Um, so I suppose the main one that probably I'm concerned about and starting to get a lot of inquiry from people um, on the back of the cracking spring we're coming into is bloat. Um, more of a risk for cattle than sheep. Sheep tend to handle the gas a fair bit better. Um, but sadly, there is no magic bullet for bloat. We saw remnants and capsules go off the market a few years ago and they haven't come back yet. Um, but look, menensin is what's in remensin and it can help. Um, but the trouble is it tastes terrible. So it's really hard to get a full dose into them um, in any other way other than a capsule, but it's an option. Um, oils and detergents, uh, 
look, they work really well if you've just got trough water. If you don't have um, trough water and, and animals have choices to, as to where to drink, you know, if they don't drink out of the trough, they're not getting the medication. So that's not necessarily um, uh, a great solution. Um, you can drench them with it. Um, but I guess the flip side to that is you've got to bring them into the yards to do that. And we really want to minimise time off feed. Um, so things we can do to help prevent bloat is time our grazing. So if we do have the luxury of other grazing options until um, our legumes are a little bit less risky. So generally that's once they've started to mature a bit, uh, they're out in flower and things like that. Um, start grazing them then. Uh, if not, gradual introduction into the paddock um, can really help. Things can go sideways really quickly with bloat. So even if you say to yourself, oh, I'll just let them in there for a few hours, that should be okay. Sometimes it's not. Um, ideally let them into the paddock um, after smoko sort of as a guide. Um, once the dew's off the plants, once they've had a bit of time to photosynthesize, um, in the sunlight and that they tend to get a little bit less gassy. So that can be an option. Um, and there also is a bit of a um, thought that maybe um, keeping our sodium, so our salt levels and our calcium and magnesium levels up can be helpful. Um, they're sort of, they play a role in how well our muscles function or how well our animals' muscles function. So if our muscles are functioning really well, the rumen has the ability to contract. It's essentially just a big muscle. Uh, it's working well, and maybe that can help expel some of the gas. Um, I feel like given the value of stock at the moment, you know, a bit of lick um, is certainly worth the pun if it does, it does help and save something. The other thing too is um, the end result of pulpy kidney and bloat look the same um, and that's dead animals that are really puffy. Um, so five in one boosters um, are probably, you know, cheap insurance. Um, the clostridial vaccines are really good um, at everything sort of except pulpy kidney, I guess, because it's something that exists naturally in the animals anyway. Um, and it just thrives under certain situations to be detrimental. So probably worth a thought um, to, if they haven't had a shot uh, in the last sort of six to eight weeks in a high challenge environment, um, it might be worth running, um, running one into them. And then if the environment remains challenging um, every sort of six to eight weeks after that. Um, so that's bloat. Um, any questions interrupt at any stage? Um, I suppose the other thing that I'm pretty concerned about um, is nitrate, nitrite poisoning. Um, plants uh, uptake nitrogen to grow and they do that in the form of nitrate. Um, the rumen microbes convert that nitrate to nitrite. And once too much of that enters the bloodstream, it uh, basically stops the blood from being able to carry oxygen. So fatal, unfortunately. Um, look, um, our cereal crops are really bad for it. So if you are thinking about putting out some fertilizer um, just to boost your um, cereals along to get a longer grazing window out of it, bear in mind that it might be a little herby after that. So a little bit toxic. Um, sorghum is also really bad for it. Uh, our brassicas can do it too, unfortunately. Um, weeds are also really bad for it. Basically anything can do it. Um, so yeah, it's really um, important to bear in mind. There's not a lot. We kind of just have to wait for the plants to process all that nitrate um, and grow out of it, I suppose. Um, so timing of that, um, cattle are a lot more susceptible than sheep to, to nitrate poisoning. Um, it's relatively easy to test for. It's not a particular expensive test to do either. 
Um, the lab in Tamworth does it, and I'm not sure where else locally you can get it done, um, but it's quite an easy, easy test to do. Um, or the other thing is to substitute feed. So they can handle a little bit um, and they will definitely get accustomed to it. So again, maybe gradual introduction if you're worried about it um, or, or some alternate feed sources. Um, so what type of, I just got one question there, Sal. Mm -hmm. What type of things will we notice with in regards to nitrate poisoning? What sort of signs? Dead. Dead is, is generally oh, the first. Right. Okay. So there's, yeah, no, so there's no. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Look, so there's um, no lead up sign? Look, they can look unwell um, and things like that. There is a quite a good fact sheet on nitrate poisoning and I can um, send you the link to that to, to send yep. through to the group. Um, yep. But I suppose the, the real telltale sign is uh, if you find a dead animal, if you um, make them bleed through some form, so knife, you'll yep. see the blood is um, a real dark colour because it hasn't got any oxygen in it. Okay. Um, so yeah, unfortunately they do die quite, as you would imagine, once oxygen starts to stop circulating in the body, um, it yeah. goes sideways yeah. pretty quickly. Um, yeah. so, but yeah, you, there, there can be some signs if you're quick to notice them. Um, and I'll send you the fact sheet, um, to, to share okay. through the group, um, on what they are. Okay. Um, but I mean, so we can handle some levels of nitrate, but obviously once we start getting up high, um, it's a worry. The other thing too is some of our lower levels, whilst they might be toxic, they can cause abortion. So be, be really mindful of it if it's your joined breeding stock. And I suppose the other caveat to note is once those plants are cut um, for hay, if those nitrate levels are high, they won't go down. They will stay high. So we did have um, quite a few producers sadly have to write off quite a lot of hay. Um, last year, we lost some, even some tropical grass hay that had been made um, that the nitrate levels were just too high in. There wasn't a lot we could do with it. Um, silage, if you're in siling some of your crops, silage, can it can go down a little bit. Um, if you're making silage but again it won't get it from deadly to safe but it can get it from marginal back to safe so if you are thinking about cutting for hay or chopping for silage probably really is worth the hundred bucks for the test um, so something to bear in mind um, any more questions on that no, that's really, really interesting, though, because you you look at a crop of, um, you know, like a stubble paddock and, you know, if you are chasing behind with some hay and, you know, are going to store it, it's very interesting to know that that could be a problem. So yeah. $100 is easy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somehow managed to get my slideshow to go right to the end. How about I start again? Sorry about that. Um, so prussic acid for guys that are thinking about um, sorghum um, as, as we come into summer feeding options. Um, another um, chemical, so um, cyanide for, for those of you that have heard of that, you know, you feed it a teaspoon in your husband's dinner over time and you'll, um, you'll bowl him eventually. Um, so again, interferes with the way the um, oxygen gets around the body in the bloodstream um, and tends to be a result of stressed or stunted plants. So hopefully the cracking season will continue and, and that won't be um, a problem. Um, some of the, the newer varieties, so your real forage sorghum varieties, they are a lot safer. They've been really conscious of trying to breed 
um, that prussic acid out of them. But I suppose in the last few years where we've seen trouble is people that have grazed grain crops that just haven't been worth harvesting for whatever reason. Um, and there's been some issues arise out of that. Look, sulfur can help if we do have prussic acid present. It's a, a mineral that um, helps the body detoxify um, some of these things. Uh, but it's, it can help. So obviously, if the level is too high, no amount of sulfur will help that. But if it's marginal, the sulfur can help. Um, most people sort of manage the introduction onto the crops really well. Um, it's just if we get um, a rainfall event, we get some fresh young shoots coming up, um, or if we've had to stop grazing something else and then put them back onto the crop that we see problems. Um, so something to bear bear in mind there. Um, um, PEM is another one. Um, I really struggle to say the full full word of it. So it's polyencephalacia malacia, something like that anyway. My Latin's not great. Um, but basically it results as a vitamin B1 deficiency. Um, so I, there has been a few farmers who sadly have experienced that um, this season grazing brassicas. Um, and in the case of brassicas, it pops up from excess sulfur in the diet. So if you are, um, when you are choosing supplements, be really mindful, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that your supplement suits your thing. So we really have to be careful how much um, sulfur is available to the system if we're grazing brassicas. Even, um, you know, we've had a few people a few years ago um, put some fertilizer out and brassicas love sulfur. They will really look for it. So they had fertilized with some sulfur, but then as that had come through the plant, it had caused this PEM, caused this toxicity. Um, the other thing that can cause it is, is things like rock ferns. We have the vets, district vets have seen a few cases of that um, about, like rock fern tends to be um, the first thing that comes after a rainfall event. Um, and generally older stock know not to eat it too much, but introduced stock or young stock sort of haven't learned that. And there's been some issues there, um, but same thing, just be mindful um, or particularly at the at sort of now on regrazing. So if you've um, had your stock on it, but you've taken them off um, and put them on something else for a few weeks um, to let your paddock recover and regrow, and you're putting them back in there, just be really mindful of that. Um, yeah, um, reintroduction phase, I suppose. Um, the rumen bugs that can handle this stuff, they revert back very quickly when it's not present in the diet. So um, if that, you know, a couple of weeks off, you can expect those bugs to be sort of all back on. Um, and so, yeah, be mindful of that. Um, just supplementation in general, um, it really is plant specific. So it really is a matter of um, looking at your um, predominant food source um, and looking at the stock that are going on that um, and then choosing your supplement. Um, I've included the hierarchy of needs. Um, so all of these things are equally important um, and we work from the top down. So first and foremost, water is king, um, energy, protein, then our minerals, trace minerals. The absence of any one of these can, can crash the system um, or really increase your gains, but you sort of need to identify what's lacking um, and then put it out first, I suppose. And that's that sort of hole in the bucket analogy. Your production will pull up at wherever your first hole in your bucket is. Um, and, you know, in the picture, it's protein. So once we plug that hole, it'll jump up again um, and we just keep plugging the holes as we as we go along. Um, so our main things that we look to supplement, um, calcium. So I'm assuming most stock that are going on to oats will already be on it by now, but that's the big one um, that we see. 
particularly presents itself in anything that's lactating because obviously the demand for calcium is a lot greater in those stock. Um, but calcium is the mineral the body uses the most of basically. So it's pretty handy to have out. It comes from lime, so it's never particularly expensive. Um, so it's worth including. Magnesium is the other one um, that we have seen a lot of issues with up, up till now, sort of thing, particularly on the winter cereals. Um, grass tetany um, or, or hypomagnesia. Um, so worth putting out. Um, calcium and magnesium are, are buddies. Um, minerals tend to either work with each other or against each other. Um, so calcium and magnesium kind of go hand in hand um, and they're kind of hated on, I suppose, for want of a better word, by things like nitrogen, so by protein, excess protein in the diet, and also by potassium. Um, and these really lush cereal crops tend to be high in, in both of those. Um, and they, an abundance of them will stop calcium and magnesium from being absorbed. So um, well worth putting out. Uh, sodium comes from salt. So again, not a particularly um, expensive product to add to a diet. Um, and basically it, it uh, we generally think of it as just an attractant. So we add salt to our, our supplements to um, get them to eat it. Basically most stock will crave, crave salt, particularly in lush, lush pasture situations. Um, but it actually does have a role as well. Um, there's a thing called the sodium pump, um, which is basically what makes everything work, particularly the calcium magnesium. So um, as well as adding a bit of flavor, it actually does have a, a benefit. I stuck phosphorus in there because I wasn't really sure. We did have some reports um, of bone chewing um, cattle in particular to the north um, of our patch over the last few, probably since, since the drought. Um, and and um, bone, bone chewing is a um, telltale sign of a phosphorus deficiency. Um, it's the second most used mineral in the body, so after calcium. Um, and a lack of phosphorus will give us um, generally not any sort of clinical um, things like, like the calcium gives us the milk fever. Um, but it will, if it's deficient in the system, we will be experiencing production losses. So reduction in milk, um, reduction in performance um, and things like that. So if you are saying that, it's probably worth having a bit of that in the diet. Um, our other macros, um, chlorine, potassium and sulfur. Um, sulfur, I sort of mentioned already. So um, particularly helpful if we're um, looking at prussic acid and things like that. Trace minerals tend to be a little bit more, um, uh, I'm not sure environmental is the word that I want to use, but they, if they're deficient, they tend to be more as a result of a deficiency in your environment. Um, so selenium and copper are probably two that we say, um, be really mindful the window around supplementing, particularly these um, trace minerals, particularly in sheep, isn't isn't very big. So when I what I mean by that is um, moving from deficient to toxicity is is not a very big gap. Um, with our, our major minerals, um, it's a really big window. So it's, it is actually quite difficult to overdose an animal on calcium and magnesium, but it's actually not that difficult to do it on some of our, our macros. So be really mindful um, if you are selenium deficient, don't go out and buy all your products with selenium in it because you could create a, a toxicity issue. Um, and again, if you're choosing supplements, um, cattle need a lot more copper than sheep. Um, they're a lot less sensitive to it as well. So if you are buying loose licks and products and stuff um, that are for both, just make sure that they are going to suit your, your stock. So, that, you know, um, we did have some issues a few years ago um, where there was too much copper in um, a product and, and it proved detrimental to sheep. It was perfect for the cattle, but it, it wasn't great for the sheep. So bear in mind with those. Um, I've stuck these two in here, but I really hope we, the tap doesn't turn off and we don't have to talk about them. Um, but you know, there are cases when we do need to supplement energy, whether that's because there's not enough feed in the paddock 
or that feed is not good enough quality to do the job we need it to do. Um, so if we're talking about supplementing energy, generally we're talking about um, the bulk of an animal's diet. Um, we talk in megajoules per kilogram of dry matter. Um, and yeah, like I said, hopefully that we don't need to have those conversations as we move into summer, but it's something to bear in mind. Um, and things like our grains and stuff like that are obviously our cheapest form of energy. Protein supplementation um, is something that actually I've had a few questions about already. Um, and there's two types of protein supplementation we can use in ruminants. Um, the first one is, is true protein. So I kind of like to think of that as natural protein. Um, so we get that from our meals, um, cottonseed lupins, things like that, that are naturally high in protein. Um, the other type of protein is um, non-protein nitrogen. So urea and I suppose our synthetic um, proteins. Um, only the use of those is only made possible through um, the microbes in the rumen, which is how we get to a crazy um, crude protein percentage when we look at urea. Um, so someone way smarter than me came up with a formula. So it's just the level of nitrogen times 6.25, which is how we wind up getting more than 100% in those. Look, I'm the way I was taught to use um, protein supplementation, particularly urea and things like that, was if there's less than 30% green in the paddock, those products can be added um, and, and be of benefit. Um, there are times when we do add protein to diets, you know, when we um, are trying to gear up rams for joining and things like that, we might give them lupins or something like that to bolster their sperm production. Um, but be really mindful with excess protein. So true protein will give us a level of bypass protein, which can be helpful. So bypass protein is protein that's absorbed um, after the room, I suppose, so in the um, intestines and things like that. Um, so similar to the way I suppose we absorb protein. And there can be some production benefits in, in having bypass protein. True protein, uh, um, non-protein nitrogen, so are you raising that? they generally won't bypass the, the nature of their um, digestibility, I suppose, in the rumen is such that they pretty much break down to ammonia as soon as they hit the room. And there are some products on the market that have fat coatings and things which can slow that process down, but they're pretty rapidly digestible, which is where we run into problems with them as well. Um, so if we have too much protein or too much ammonia in particular, um, in the rumen, it will look to get rid of that. Um, and the easiest way for it to do that is to pee it, to pee it out. Um, and it takes energy to um, shift that from the rumen um, and, and into the urine to be excreted. Um, so too much protein is basically the Atkins diet. Most people are pretty familiar with that. It was, it was quite the rage a while ago. Um, so animals will lose weight if we give them too much protein and they don't have enough energy to go with because they are using up the energy to dispel that. The other thing too is our non-protein nitrogens tend to be awesome for cattle, but they're not as effective in sheep and then even less effective in dorpers, even less effective in goats. Um, the flip side of that is even more toxic in goats, dorpers, sheep, and then cattle. So Urea and water don't mix. Um, what happens is if we have lick out or even blocks that get the um, bird's net, uh, bird bath sort of in the top of them where the animals have licked it out and created a bowl, the urea will dissolve in that water and then the ammonia will just float on top of the water. So an animal comes along, drinks the water um, and it proves to be fatal. So if you do have product out, particularly as they're talking about a decent sort of stormy season this summer, make sure that those products can drain. So um, I know a lot of people love to use the um, Anapro tubs, like the big plastic tubs that we put out the molasses-based supplements in. Um, they're great, but they generally, and nobody wants to drill holes in the bottom of them. So they're not the 
best um, thing for feeding out urea-based licks um, because they will, they'll hold the water um, and those puddles can, can prove to be fatal. So something to bear in mind there. Um, so I've sort of touched on a lot of these, but I'll just recap. Um, so supplements, if you're grazing cereal crops, something with decent levels of calcium, magnesium and sodium in them. Um, I've put plus or minus fibre. We're probably a bit late um, in the season to be too worried about fibre. Most of our crops are pretty mature now. But early on, um, we did see a lot of animals benefit from fibre. It just slowed everything down a little bit. Um, and the rumen really relies on fibre and structure to function. So that was something to bear in mind. The other thing I haven't mentioned is I did say that our winter cereals are particularly high in potassium um, and that is antagonistic to calcium and magnesium. Um, there, just be mindful of your products if you are supplementing on these. Um, so whilst a molasses-based product is awesome, it's sugar, who doesn't love sugar? the stock will eat it. Molasses is a product that is really high in potassium. So we don't wanna be adding to that potassium load in an attempt to get more calcium into the diet. Um, so I, I'm not a massive fan of molasses-based supplements for grazing winter cereals. Um, but, you know, I suppose, um, you know, if we, if we can't get them to eat it using salt or sea tract, then it might, might be a necessary evil. If we move on to grazing the cereal stubble, which I know a lot of people as a rule don't do, um, but I, I have heard that there's also, um, there's a few people recommending it um, to try and curb another mouse outbreak. Um, so if you are gonna graze your stubble, um, you know, sheep in particular do really well on it because they do have the ability to pick up all of the spent grain there. But be mindful of an acidosis risk when you first turn them turn them out. So make sure they're full um, and things like that before going on there. But again, our cereal um, products from the lush plant right through to the grain and the stubble, they will lack calcium. So um, that's probably something worth keeping up there. Um, and sodium as well. The other thing too is sometimes we see water belly, particularly in weathers. Um, so the calcium and the sodium will help that, should help that. Um, look, we might need protein as well to keep our production up if, if everything's um, golden, I suppose. And look, and depending on our production goals, we might need a bit of energy as well. Um, brassicas, the you know, be mindful of the sulfur um, and the calcium. Um, also, when you're grazing, if anyone's looking at grazing their canola um, after harvest and things like that, nitrate, it will be a big risk there too. Um, sorghum, if you choose to go down that path, sulfur for the prussic acid, and again, calcium would be helpful. Um, and same with sorghum stubble. Um, you probably will need some protein as well. It tends to be fairly fibrous and the extra protein in the diet can help the rumen bugs break down that fiber. But if you do get showers of rain and start to get some shoots growing, be really mindful of your regrowth toxicity. Uh, heat stress, um, I feel like it was a pretty mild winter really. So maybe it's gonna be a hot summer. Um, you know, it's fairly um, intuitive stuff when it comes to heat stress, but make sure you've got adequate water um, in the paddock, adequate shade and shelter. When I say adequate on the shade and shelter front, we do, if it tends to get really hot and really humid, if animals are, you actually are better off with no shade, then not enough shade for everyone. So um, particularly, um, I see it a lot in feedlot environments. So all the animals will cluster together to get the shade, but then the humidity under that shade builds up to the point where it's, it's more detrimental than helpful. So if you are, um, you know, grain feeding or anything over the summer, make sure that there's enough shade so that they can camp under it and, and be spread out enough. 
um, so that they don't sort of add to the heat load by, by all huddling together. Um, you know, the timing of your husbandry and handling operations. There is some stuff we can do to manipulate diets, um, but obviously that's not in a paddock situation. It is what it is for them. But if you are confinement feeding, um, there are a few things we can do um, around that. So high fibre will generate more heat. Um, so, um, you know, bear in mind, you know, the, the big feedlots probably do manipulate their diets a little bit through the heat um, to make sure that the animals can handle it as well as possible. And I suppose the other thing I really wanted to point out was be really mindful of your bulls and rams. Um, you know, some of you might have finished using them by then, so you mightn't be particularly worried, but if they are still out and still working, um, sperm is um, produced on a cycle, um, 61 days for bulls, 49 days for rams. So if we do accidentally get the boys a little bit hot, um, we can expect them to possibly be infertile for a period of time. Um, so, you know, if you're in the middle of joining, you really don't have the luxury of a gap during that. So be really mindful of looking after those guys um, during the heat if you, if you need them to still be productive. Water. Um, so water is king, particularly when it's hot. Quality will affect how much they drink, how much they drink will affect their performance. You can have the best diet in the world in front of them, but if they're not drinking enough water, they will not perform for you. Um, so be really mindful of the level of salt um, in your water. Um, and then that'll reflect also how much salt we can include in our diets. Um, again, sheep are probably handle salty a little bit better than cattle. Um, be mindful of the minerals in the water, the pH, the algae contamination. And I suppose the other thing too is just how much they actually need. Um, I think this is probably um, not new to anyone um, that had to water stock through the drought. Um, but yeah, bear, bear that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is the, like if we do see a particularly stormy season, um, we have got some Opti ways, which are sort of an in paddock way system um, set up as some trial stuff um, across the Northwest. And last summer, we, we really noticed that um, there would be periods of time, sort of three to five days, where the stock weights were just terrible. And when we married that up with weather data, it was post storm events. So um, we probably had really underestimated how much um, heavy downpours and stuff like that really affected the weight gain of our stock. Um, so, and we also saw some incidents where, um, so it's one producer, he turned off stock um, after um, he had bought them in, weighed them, um, then there was a storm event and then he turned off and he also saw a really high level of dark cutting through, um, through his cattle. And dark cutting is a result of a low glycogen level in the muscles. Um, and we are speculating, we think that that was linked to the days that they didn't eat so much post weather event. So something to really bear in mind, if you are grain feeding as well, weather events, um, particularly through the summer, can really lead to spike feeding. So um, they donate, 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 they're starving, they gorge on the grain, they give themselves a tummy ache, and then they donate, 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 and they get into this real roller coaster. And it's really hard to get them out of that once they've started to do that. So, I mean, we can't control the weather, but um, we can control our, our operations around it. So just something to bear, bear in mind. Um, and the other thing too, um, if we do see a cracking summer, which I hope we do, but the parasite burden that comes with that. Um, so buffalo fly, three-day sickness um, in the cattle is probably something that I have a sneaking suspicion we might see a lot of um, this summer. 
Um, obviously, worm control um, is going to be a big issue. And then um, our stock in, in wet, muddy um, conditions, whether we start to see some feet, feet problems or not. Um, again, we can't control the weather, but I suppose it's just um, being aware of those things. Um, so that if we start to see them popping up, um, you know, we've got a bit of a plan, a plan. Now, um, in regards to spike feeding, um, just moving back to your last slide, yeah, yeah. What's, what's a window that you notice that um, that kind of happening post-storm? Like, and is it like a three-day window when uh, things like that in a feedlot situation or...? Once it so that's when it starts, like it'll start in those okay. couple of days immediately after. So you'll notice your consumption um, probably during the next day might be down. Um, and that's so that's when it starts. And the trouble is that it like it it depends how the mob then evens themselves out. So some animals, mm -hmm. once they get into a, a spike feeding pattern, it's really hard to get them to, to stop doing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for a lot of people and um, animals, those particular, like the whole mob won't do it. The whole mob will, will probably go off its feet a bit, but most of them generally will come back on successfully. But if it seems like they're mm -hmm. not and you're starting to see a lot of um, bubbly, horrible manure in the pen, um, unwell animals and things like that, you might have to, drop your grain content down and semi-start again with them um, to get them out of that mm. roller coaster. Um, but you, you should notice it within a few, few days. Yeah. And just another question. Um, mm. Is there any specific supplement for water belly or is it um, just a case of monitoring or is like I know I personally have spoken to you about this in the past, but, yeah, is it an actual, if they were in a paddock, on a grain paddock, you know, is there a specific lick or something that you could put out or is it something that you make up and put out? Look, you um, prevention's better than cure there. There are um, products you can give them, um, but the trouble is they're, they're bitter and they taste, so you can give them ionic salts um, and that will um, uh, help. So we would generally add them at, at sort of 2% um, to a ration. So in a paddock situation, in a loose lick, we really can't get them to eat them because um, they just mm. taste too terrible. They won't. Um, so in a paddock situation, generally um, they come about as a calcium um, phosphorus imbalance um, and also sometimes from a lack of water. Um, so our cereal products are sort of naturally high in phosphorus, low in calcium, and we need that to be the other way around. So if we're in an ideal world, our diet would generally be sort of two to one calcium to phosphorus. So double the amount of calcium than phosphorus. Um, when that goes around the wrong way, um, we see these. There's a, oh, there are a couple of different um, types of stone that can build up, but the most common ones um, that we see um, result from that. So by making sure we've got adequate calcium in the diet um, to maintain that two to one um, and enough sodium in the diet, so salt in the diet um, to make sure they're drinking enough water uh, and things like that can help. But like our ammonium chlorides and, um, sorry, not ammonium chloride. I've had a blank as to what the other one's called. We can add it to the diet, but we really need them to probably be full feeding to get them to eat it, if that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, that was all of the stuff I, formal stuff I had prepared. So we've still got 10, 15 minutes. Um, yeah, anyone can does we anyone? Yeah, does anyone else have any questions um, that, or type into the chat box um, if you've got any? I probably have another one. Um, and this is, 
I suppose just hay, like putting a bale of hay in a paddock, like obviously where we live, there's clover is just in abundance. Further you go out west, it probably doesn't happen as much. Um, it seems to happen in our little patch quite a lot. Does putting some hay in self feeders out in the paddock actually help those stock, um, you know, not get bloat and things like that? Or is it a waste of time? No, no. Um, look, look, we can't make them eat it, obviously. Um, but alternate food sources will always be helpful. Um, yeah. There's no, I mean, so when you choose your hay, like probably not loose and hay, obviously. Um, no, no. But, but yeah, so if we um, provide them with an alternate feed source, that can definitely, definitely help. Yeah. So we can't, yeah, we can't force them to eat it. And sometimes they choose not to. Um, you know, I think they've no, got a bit of, yeah, but yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. It can minimize, help with minimize. pretty much any, <laughs> anything that's caused by eating too much of one food um, can be helped yeah. by providing another food, food source. Yeah. So for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, if anyone has <clears throat> any questions that they don't want to ask um, or they you think about something afterwards, please reach out. Um, my mobile number is there and my email address um, on deck uh, two days a week at the moment. Um, so if you get me on a day, I'm not on deck, just leave a message to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, Justine McNally is probably your closest district vet. She's based in Moree. Um, we've got Ted based in Warrialda. Um, Sean and Megan based in Narrabri as well. Um, super great, super helpful. Um, sickness, um, animals that have died that you're not sure about, just reach out and give them give them a bell there. Um, they're always floating about. They're more than happy to, to help. Yeah, awesome, Sal. Well, no, thank you very much um, for joining us and providing such a wealth of information about what we need to look out for. Um, it goes into a lot more depth than, you know, than most think, I think. Um, and good seasons, like bad seasons, give us new um, things to watch out for. So thank you very yeah. much, Sal. No, no worries. Um, and sadly, good seasons tend to be a little bit harder to manage yeah. than than poor ones we have very few people lost a lot of animals through the tough times um it's heartbreaking to see um people lose them in the good times so um please sing out if we can help yeah excellent um awesome i'm just going to screen share now um Hopefully, you guys, yeah, there we go. Awesome. So just wanting to thank you all for joining us. Um, this, yeah, is recorded. So if you feel that you'd love to share it with a friend, please do so. Hopefully, it'll help somebody um, and may spark some more interest um, for some questions for Sal or um, clarify any details. So thanks again, Sal. Thanks for everyone for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Ben. Bye, Sal.